So just so we know who's who, we're, we're hoping to have someone coming online, but Izzy has come in. Um, Izzy's a mum via surrogacy in the USA, um, and she worked with Sorrow Connections. Um, you heard from Megan already earlier today, so we're going to hear about the US journey from Izzy. Um, and Dippin and Dipti are parents via Greece. Um, and it's obviously there with the help of Embryo Clinic. And so we're going to hear about the Greek journey process as well. And hopefully we'll hear a bit about Georgia if our Georgia parent comes online a bit later. Um, so this is a really useful session. Thank you guys so much for making the effort to come in. It's really helpful for us because so many people are wondering what's it really like? How does it work? Um, Izzy, can I just start with you to ask you a bit about um, what were the medical reasons that you guys required surrogacy? Oh, I should give you a mic. Should I use one of these? Yeah, yeah, you just put it up close to your mouth. Does that work? Oh, yeah, that really works. Uh, so what were the medical reasons? Um, I was very lucky that I was able to have my first daughter naturally. Yep. Um, however, I had a, a few complications in my final trimester, which we weren't aware of until I gave birth. Um, so my daughter was born five weeks early, and I suffered from a major placental issue. Um, suspected placenta accretia, whereby the placenta um, buries very deeply into the lining of your womb, which meant that it could, um, it was very hard to make it come away after I gave birth. Um, so I had a pretty traumatic experience uh, for a few hours after birth, which um, meant that I actually had a piece of placenta left inside me, mm -hmm. and um, and lots of complications that happened over the next six weeks, which meant that I finally had it removed um, a couple of months after birth, but it left me with some really um, awful damage and a lot of scar tissue. And I have ended up with something called Ashman syndrome, yep, yep. which is essentially scarring of the womb. And I had a 90% obliterated womb uh, lining. So... I was obviously unable to have a baby naturally after that. But mm. also from having had placenta accretia, it would have been very dangerous for me to have had a, a natural um, pregnancy and birth again. But I did try really hard to um, have it corrected. I had multiple rounds of surgery to remove my adhesions, but very unsuccessfully. Um, so eventually um, I came to the conclusion that the only way forward for me was surrogacy. Okay. Uh, was it a hard process to come to terms with that you'd need a surrogate? Yeah, of course. I mean, the, the entire process, I mean, my, the birth and all of the things that followed after that, were it was immensely traumatic, obviously, discovering mm. that I'd never be able to carry another baby and, and have a healthy pregnancy again. I come from quite a large family. I've got lots of siblings, and as does my husband, and I always wanted to have um, definitely more than one baby, maybe even a bigger family. So it was, yeah, it was immensely traumatic going through the whole process. It was probably the hardest thing I've ever been through. But, and coming to the decision to use a surrogate is a very brave thing to do. Um, you know, it takes quite a while to get your head around it and, um, you know, to feel proud about it and excited about it. It did take quite a long time. Um, but one thing I will say that I had the most amazing experience in the States because in the UK, when I would tell people what had happened, everybody would naturally say, oh, I'm so sorry, that's awful. And um, I'd be like, I have to use a surrogate. And people are like, oh, that's so awful. When you go to America, everybody goes, congratulations, and turns it into a really positive thing yeah. um, and really helps you to see you know, the positivity and the way forward and helps you to believe that everything's going to be okay and that if you just trust in the process that it will happen for you eventually. Obviously, it's difficult along the way, but I was just greeted by so much wonderful positivity that, yeah, yeah, yeah that was really helpful. Um, Dippin, what about you guys? What, what was the medical reason you guys needed surrogacy? Yeah. So... Um we were married in 2010, um, so four months after marriage, um, my wife was Dipti was diagnosed with breast cancer. Yep. Um, so obviously, very devastated. Um, but prior to uh, the treatment, um, we had a little chat with the oncologist, and we decided to freeze um, our embryos. Mm -hmm. um, luckily, we cut like five. Five embryos were produced, and we froze them at Guy's Hospital. Um, then, obviously, uh, commenced the uh, uh, all the chemotherapy, radi radiology, and all that kind of stuff. And then, in 2013, uh, we took a break from all the medication to try naturally. Yep, yep. Um, via IVF, but that wasn't successful. We also then started. That was the time we kind of started. Um, 
investigating the surrogacy and adoption um, processes. Um, then in 2017, my wife had further complications, so she needed another operation around the womb and whatnot. So we would try to, so then she could try and carry those embryos that we uh, frozen. Um, so 2018, she'd recovered. Um, so obviously took IVF medication and whatnot. But it was a really long journey. We're talking about years here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so it started in 2010. Um, yeah, wow. Yeah, so 28... Yeah, sorry, go on. What, um, so you, what research did you do about where you, where you could do surrogacy? Did you look at many places? Yeah, I mean, we looked at everything, going from India, Georgia, Greece, US... Yeah. Um, obviously, India kind of what was it around 2016, wherever they they kind of um, stopped it for for foreign couples. Um, US we found very expensive and just not accessible to us. So obviously we started looking around Europe yeah. and Greece because it's so close mm -hmm. um, and good links with um, uh, the UK government and whatnot. So we decided on Greece to be yeah, honest. Okay. Lizzie, what made you guys decide on the USA as a destination? What was good for you about USA? Um, so for us, I think, you know, I did do a bit of research as well. I, in, I went to Brilliant Beginnings here in London, and yeah. they offer this package so. where they talk to you about all the different types of surrogacy on offer. Um, obviously, I was so lucky because I already had a baby, but it did mean that investigating British surrogacy just wasn't really an option because... They said it would take maybe like five to seven years yeah. to find a surrogate because most of the surrogates, which are in very short supply in the UK, yep, yep. want to be surrogates for people who you know don't have kids already or cannot have kids under any circumstances. What was the time frame that you were going to looking at for a UK surrogate? Um, so I, I was told it was going to take you know, five, three, three at the least, but like up to seven years. Yeah. Um, by this stage, my daughter was already three and, you know, I wanted to have a small gap. Um, so they presented to us the package of international surrogacy was what they recommended was actually at the time just American surrogacy or Canadian surrogacy. Um, they didn't, they told us about the Ukraine um, and... Um, I did my own investigation into the Ukraine as well. I have a friend who's had a baby through surrogacy in the Ukraine. Um, and, but for me, we were it was just about in reach for us to be able to do the gold standard. Um, and I felt like, as it was such a big decision, we were able to just about achieve that financially, although, of course, it was a huge, huge stretch, and it is an eye-watering amount of money. Yeah it did feel like for us the best decision because it was that gold standard. Yep. Uh, very, very regulated. And lots and, you know, a long history of very successful surrogacy throughout states like California and Oregon and Illinois yep. um, particularly. So, um, you know, we, it was, was just about possible for us to do that. So we did make that decision. But I did do a lot of research in terms of whereabouts in America. It, you know, it's a lot more affordable in certain places than others, you know, it depends what agency and clinic you choose and whatnot. Yeah. So. Well, so what made you choose to work with Sorrow Connections in, in Oregon? Um, so, um, the, well, I spoke to lots of different agencies and I also did a lot, a lot, a lot of research. I was on a lot of Facebook forums, yep. um, a lot of the reviews sites, and Sorrow Connections came up a lot as always being one of the highest reviewed agencies. Um, also, though, when I was looking into the costs, because obviously it is incredibly expensive, the costs were just a lot more transparent than a lot of the other agencies I was speaking to. Yeah. Um, it was very, very clear exactly what you were going to be charged for what. There was no packages. There was no, you'll get stung later for this legal fee and you'll get stung for this. It was just very, very, very transparent. Um, and and um, the agency fees were a lot cheaper than a lot of the other places that I was looking at. Um, I then connected with Megan, who's the agency owner, um, mm -hmm. and we had a brilliant connection with her, my husband and I, straight away. My husband's, like, very much the guy in the detail and the numbers, and he was like, of all the people that we spoke to, it was like, it was just super clear how it was going to run. Like, it was three stages of pavement. They would cover this, yeah. and that was it. But also, I was really drawn to Oregon as a state. I think, you know, it's a very liberal state. Um, it, it doesn't generally, it wasn't charging as much as a lot of the Californian agencies. Yep, yep. 
Um, and um, my husband's twin brother lives, he lives in California, but it would have been an easy journey to get up to Oregon. So that was the reason that we chose Surrey Connections and we had no, we were very, very happy with our choice. Yeah, yeah. And Dippin, you guys use the embryo clinic in Thessaloniki. What made you choose to go with those guys? Um, it was the second bout of cancer, my wife, um, in 2018, when we had a scan ready to try naturally, it, it transpired that the cancer had returned. So when she got over that, that period, she attended um, one of these surrogacy um, seminars. And that's where we met Dr. She met Dr. Sakos, um, who embryo, runs embryo embryo clinic, embryo clinic yeah. Um, and that's basically it's the way he spoke. To be honest, he was really frank. He mm. didn't try and sell you it. It was just we could help you with this. We could help you. We just really liked the yeah. way he was speaking. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. And he again, he was just very upfront with the charges, right? The costs. Do you want to take me? Yeah. Um, he had a clear kind of um, conversation with us about this is how long it will take. Um, you know, it can take up to two, and, two, two and a half years. Yeah. Um, he was very clear about the costs. He was very clear about us coming to visit the clinic before um, and making our own decision and visiting other clinics in Greece as well. Mm. Um, yeah, yeah. And did so you go over there and make embryos, or did you use a donor, or what did so you do? So we there? had five frozen embryos in um, <laughs> Guy's Hospital in the UK. Yeah. So we arranged for um, a medical courier to ship them mm -hmm. to ship them over. Mm -hmm. And again, like at the time, all of this felt quite daunting. But the thing is, there's people doing this day in, day out. Like the medical courier was like, right leave it all to me. Guys were familiar with me, you know, the concept of me wanting to move my embryos to Greece. So yeah. it was quite straightforward in the end. Yeah, yeah. And Izzy, what about you guys? Did you have to ship embryos like this or you didn't have to do that? Um, no, so I, my um, fertility clinic here in London, when I got to the end of the road of my situation with Asherman's where it was agreed by all that I couldn't go any further to have a baby myself, um, my doctor in London immediately connected me with somebody in San Diego yep. um, who was a colleague and friend of his um, who he knew was big in the surrogacy world and um, that was at San Diego Fertility Center and his name was Dr. D and um, I immediately spoke to him and he was one of the people that was very enthusiastic, very positive and made it all seem like it was going to be quite easy uh, of course, it's never easy, but you know that it was certainly within reach. And um, they were, it, I was going to be doing my first part of the egg retrieval, the medication and scans in London, and then fly over to San Diego to have the retrieval. So yep. I did that twice. Um, and because the two clinics were connected, it did make it a lot easier. Wow, okay, so you went twice for egg retrievals. Man, okay. Yeah, yeah. I did. But how did you go with making embryos? Well, the first time um, I didn't have such a great number of eggs and um, I didn't actually PGS test them the first time, yep. um, which obviously is very common in the States, not very common in the UK. Um, I was 34 at the time, so I was perhaps thinking maybe I didn't need to get them PGS tested and we'd save some money or, you know, I didn't have a huge number, so I didn't was worried about the embryos being damaged, which actually is, if I'll, I, I'm honest, a regret of mine because um, I, had, I had two failed transfers and then um, I had a very, very close relationship with my surrogate and I really didn't want to lose her. So I then went out and did another retrieval and PGS tested the embryos and I got 12 and of that four came back chromosomally normal and that first one that got transferred out of that batch stuck and is now my daughter who's 20 months old. Amazing. <laughs> uh, how long did it take you to match with a surrogate? Nine weeks. Wow. I probably would have matched earlier. I did speak to another br wonderful surrogate um, a few weeks earlier who was really, really lovely, but we, there was just one thing we didn't agree on. Yeah. Um, so I probably would have matched pretty almost instantly. Um, I signed up at the end of September and by end of Oct... No, yeah, mid-November I was matched. Yeah, that was it. Okay, well, and uh, Dippin, what about you guys? I assume it was much longer for you, Dippity, was it? Well, we were first matched with somebody within five weeks okay. of... Um, sign, registering with Embryo Clinic, and then we had a preference for someone younger than that, younger, although in reality it 
doesn't matter because as long as the wound is healthy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it was just psychological. Yeah. And then we waited, and I think there were quite a few couples working with embryo clinic at that time, so it took about six, seven months. And then we had, um, we found another surrogate, they found another surrogate, and we matched with her. Yeah. And then within two months, she was pregnant. Unfortunately, you know, that, that pregnancy didn't succeed. Um, Can you explain to people, though, the court case you've got to do in Greece before yes. the first transfer? So yes. people understand yeah. that. Yep. So as soon as you register with the clinic, only once you've found your surrogate, you go to court and you explain in that court paper um, the reason, the rationale for why you need to use surrogacy. And um, it's, you know, a very short court hearing. It, it was bang on the time of lockdown, the first lockdown. Oh. So we weren't able to travel. So we were able to do uh, like a power of attorney. And our lawyer at Nomos went and represented us. And that was all quite straightforward. We didn't have any further questions from the judge or from the court or the people looking at, uh, looking at our, our, our request. Um, I think it was approved within a week. Okay, it well, was pretty pretty quick. Yeah. Um, Izzy, for you, once you're matched with a surrogate, how long do you need to before you can do the first embryo transfer? Is there lots of sort of paperwork for the legals and that? Um, I would say there is some, but I can't really remember. <laughs> I know we did a lot of. There was a pre-birth order, right? I feel like most of my legals happened whilst she was. Uh, yeah, yeah, that was it. You did the contracts beforehand with the surrogate. Yes. And then you had another legal stage just before the birth. Right. So, yeah. Okay, okay. So you but it, it was all the legal side was super straightforward yeah. in, in the US yeah, and okay. very much handled by my agency anyway. Okay. So. And so, so you, the first surrogate you introduced, you thought, no, I won't go with her, but the second one you used Yes, you Jess, yeah, 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 yeah. And how do you meet your surrogate? Was it via Zoom or how do you. Interact? Yeah, via Zoom. Um, so, yes, you know. There are, you know, over in Oregon, and I'm in London. But um, yeah. And was so it, we, were you driving this more than your husband was, or who was sort of making decisions about the surrogate? Was it? No, that was totally a joint decision. I mean, I was probably uh, originally driving forward the process more, but actually, it was completely equal. And in terms of choosing a surrogate, like if I'd matched with somebody that he didn't like, um, yeah, that that wouldn't have washed. But I just don't think that ever would have happened. We we tend to always like the same people anyway. So, um, yeah, we connected over Zoom and then just got to know each other a lot more via WhatsApp, to be honest with you, yeah. um, which was the way we communicated throughout, yeah. generally. And, guys, how does this work in Greece with the surrogate match? Do, do, you, do you have a conversation with them via Zoom as well or, or not? Yes. So um, our surrogate didn't, is a Greek national and didn't speak English and we don't speak Greek. So originally we were planning to visit. There was the lockdown, so we... Um, had a conversation and the clinic acted as our translator. It was just, you know, a short conversation. Um, and then we swapped numbers and we communicated using Google Translate um, oh, and wow. WhatsApp as yeah. well. <laughs> okay. um, so, you know, the, the way our relationship worked is that up front we were very clear is that our relationship is as much or as little as you want it to be. And what did your surrogate want? Did she want to get to know you guys or not? She, yeah, she, she wanted us to be in contact she wanted to feel cared for um, so we were in contact we were in contact I'd say once a week at least um, with a te you know a sh it would be a short text message conversation um, after the birth she wasn't so you know she, she didn't really want to keep contact again completely fine with us we didn't have a preconceived idea of what we were expecting yeah yeah and is it you did you say i want a surrogate who's going to be besties with me or, or did you well i was just very open to how the relationship would take its course naturally like yeah. being um like a good communicator um was important to us um like so you know when we wanted to get hold of her we could get hold of her and vice yeah. versa um, yeah. but you know seeing how the relationship progressed naturally I'd say it actually was just a very, it was quite a gradual process. We went through quite a lot together. I had the two failed transfers. Um, but then when she did become pregnant, we traveled over to Oregon at the 20 week scan. So we got to know her and her husband and her kids a lot better then, which was really, really important for us. We got to get a measure of what it was gonna be like in Oregon and Portland and where we might live for a bit and mm -hmm. you know, 
where the hospital was and all of that stuff was really important for me to be able to visualize exactly what the experience was going to be like. Yeah. Um, and I'd say actually our relationship grew a lot more at the time when she was giving birth and in the weeks that followed, we stayed in, in Portland for another five, four or five weeks after that. And we hung out with them a lot then, just you know, as friends, um, got to know her husband really well, who was really, really a wonderful person too. And they were just incredibly, incredibly warm and generous. Um, and our kids got on really well. And actually that was, I probably initially thought at the beginning that I wasn't that fussed about the relationship afterwards, but having gone through the experience, I'm so pleased that we did have a great relationship and it stayed that way and we'll always be in contact, so yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's really nice. Um, I mean, for you guys, Dipton and Dipty, what were the biggest hurdles in, in, in doing this? What were the hardest parts? To be honest, the hardest part was not being able to see our surrogate due to lockdown. Because of COVID. Because of COVID. Um, if COVID hadn't happened, I'd say the next thing would be just the amount of paperwork that you have to complete, which at the time when you're juggling a job, you just have to be really organised yeah. to make sure that you're not um, leaving all the paperwork when the baby's there. And you want to, you're then torn between spending time with the baby and completing your paperwork. So I think that that was the biggest hurdle. Yeah, yeah. Izzy, what about for you guys? What was hardest? Um, well, for me personally, the biggest hurdle was the, it was the failed transfers. That was, yeah. that was a really difficult time, definitely, because you've got so much. Um, it, it's just such a disappointment to have a failed transfer. And then when you have a second one, it's really, really crushing. So um, you said the first transfer didn't work. No, the first transfer and the second transfer didn't work. Um, oh, my God. And, and so <laughs> the third? Yeah, the third worked. Yeah, yeah, the okay, third wow. worked, yeah. And that was all fine. But, yeah, that was the most difficult time. But also, I, were, uh, I did have a baby in the middle of a global pandemic. So Effie was born on June 20... Yeah, in June 2020, in the middle of a global travel ban. And so we had to get a visa um, to be able to get into America. Um, and that took... We had to apply for that. My husband's pretty good at the paperwork and, mm -hmm. uh, and that kind of stuff. He quite likes bureaucracy, filling in forms, <laughs> and, and like managing to do things himself without having to pay for it. Um, so, um, we, yeah, we got our visa. We didn't get any legal help with that. We just applied to, yeah, um, to get the visa. And it took about six to eight weeks. But you don't get any updates during that time as to whether they're going gra to grant it for you. Wow. And then the due date was coming ever quicker. However, it was granted to us. We managed to get out there 10 days before she gave birth. Um, and, yeah, it was all super smooth out there. However... Were you able to be in the, in the room for the birth or not allowed? Yeah, I was in the room for the birth, but my husband couldn't come to the birth. Um, Can you describe what it was like being in the, in the, in the delivery room for you as a, as a first... Yeah, I mean, it was, the, it was a pretty nerve-wracking experience. It was almost like an out-of-body experience. Um... I was super, super lucky to be there, and I, you know, the baby came straight into my arms, um, and it was a very emotional moment, but I think it was really special because also I was in a hospital in Oregon whereby they'd done a lot, a lot of surrogacy cases, and I had my own midwife. Jess had her own midwife. There was an obstetrician, uh, OBGYN, as they call them in the States, and there was a pediatrician as well. And they, we were both being looked after in different ways. I had my own room, which was just next to Jess's, and they made it feel really personal and really special. What, what state were you in for the birth? Huh? Which state was this in? Oregon. It was in Oregon, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, and so they set it up for it so that both myself and Jess were super comfortable. But also Jess and me and Todd were, you know, good friends by this stage, and just like hanging out, the three of us waiting for it all to happen. Um, Todd and I just chatted the whole way through and you know it wasn't they would already had one surrogate baby before so um, they had a pretty good thing going on between the two of them um, and it was you know it was incredible she came straight into my arms and I had skin to skin for you know a couple of hours but when I had my first baby I was so incredibly unwell I'd hemorrhaged fem very very badly and I was rushed to theatre and I was unable to really cuddle my baby for the first 24 or 48 hours after birth so actually my second birth was a, a, a much less traumatic experience. Mm -hmm. And I was sitting there in the hospital bed at night, holding my baby, doing skin to skin, feeling healthy and feeling good and not on death's door. So it, w it was pretty wonderful, to be honest. Yeah, yeah. 
Some people say to me, as in training mums, it can be psychologically difficult because you're giving up your, uh, your, your womb for someone else to do it, another woman to do it. It was yeah. hard psychologically for you to come to terms with the fact that you couldn't carry, you had to outsource that to yeah, someone else? Yeah, it, it was definitely psychologically difficult. I had a lot I had to get over to, but I knew, I knew that more than anything I wanted to have another baby, and I knew very, very, very strongly that I was meant to be a mother to more than one child. I knew that Cosy was meant to have a sibling. And then as I also, you know, because I was doing it, I think, through such a great agency and doing it in the States, like I felt really, really looked after and it felt like such a well-trodden path. Yeah. You know, all the, the whole attitude out in the States, in Oregon and through our clinic in San Diego as well, it was just very positive, very uplifting, like this is going to happen, it's going to be amazing. And so that made you feel very, very reassured. Yeah. Um, and I had a great support network in London as well with my friends and family supporting me through it. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, Dipti, for you in, in Greece, are you also allowed to be there in the room for the birth? Yes. So, um, our stories are very similar. Oh, really? <laughs> so because you were also there during COVID, weren't you? Yes. For the birth? So, we were, the, we were there during COVID. So was it difficult to get a permission to get to Greece? Um, no, it was absolutely fine right. to travel to Greece. Um, we just had to have the usual PCR tests and all of that. And again, you know, with the hospital, we had to have additional checks before we w were able to um, meet our surrogate for, at the time when she was about to deliver. I guess the main positives were that the guy, Dr. Sakos, that we'd been dealing with, that I'd met here in yep. 2019, was the same guy that delivered... Oh, wow. Our baby, which was just amazing, and that's wow. that's kind of how it works. Um, so I was allowed in the room. I was allowed in the second half of the delivery pro um, the delivery process. I'm sure, that's the wrong word, mm -hmm. but more because of COVID, so for me not to be in there the whole time, just to come in at the end. Um, again, it felt very special in terms of as soon as the baby was born. Mm. She was with me, she was handed to me, and um, at the same time, a midwife who had been doing all the scans throughout our pregnancy, she was with the Ben outside, um, kind of sitting with him, and they'd built up a great relationship. Um, so we, again, we felt very cared for, and that, that was really nice. Um, yeah, yeah. Did, is he had a was a third transfer before it worked for these guys. What about you guys? Did the transfer work first we time? We were lucky. Or? Both We had two transfers in total. The first time it worked, but it just didn't stay. Um, so, you know, we had a miscarriage. And the second time, I really wasn't expecting it to work. I thought, well, it can't be this lucky. But she was pregnant again the second time. Um, so we had the same doctor, Dr. Sakos, who transferred the embryo and then delivered Rhea, which is something like that was very special. Yeah. Yeah, yeah wow. Um, what recommendations would you give other people, Izzy, who are looking at the USA as a, as a place to go? Any tips you'd give people for, you know, what you would have done a bit differently or...? What would I have done differently? I would have PGS tested my embryos. Okay, <laughs> right. Yeah, definitely, definitely PGS test your embryos. Um, because it gives you a better success rate for each transfer. 100%. And, yep. you know, having failed transfers is completely heartbreaking. Um, so, yeah, that would be the, the main thing I would do differently. Other than that, I wouldn't do anything else differently. Like, yeah. I loved my... Uh, agency sorrow connections. I loved my surrogate, um, and despite the failed transfers, I ended up in a good place in my fertility clinic. Um, yeah. And you know, there was a lot of great staff there as well. Um, I had an amazing time in America for the six <laughs> weeks that I was there. It was a really, really happy time. Um, very looked after by our agency. Um, made some great friends. Um, and so, yeah, I feel really proud, and I, it was a very, very positive experience for me. Uh, you know, obviously, it's not the dream. Um, but, um, yeah, my advice would just be to do your research and, you know, look to have a connection with your surrogate or, you know, go with an agency that you trust but, you know, you feel like you're going to be really looked after in a personal way. Um, I wasn't particularly attracted to the much bigger agencies because I felt like um, you could get quite lost in the system and there might be lots of hidden costs and things. And I had a very, very personalized experience at Surrey Connections. So 
the um, Megan who runs the agency looked after our case right from the word go and I could WhatsApp her or email her at any time of night and she would get back to me minutes later, so yeah. Yeah, yeah. Did, that's, that's amazing. Did you, what about the issue of like, expressing colostrum or breast milk with your surrogate? Was that talked about or done? Oh or? yes, yes, so our, um, our surrogate Jess, she pumped for us for, for a really long time actually. Wow. She's a big um, advocate of breast milk. And, and did you have to sort of ask her? Do you ask her at, at, at the start, would you do it or...? Well, I was actually going to try to breastfeed myself. Oh, um, you mean stimulate your milk production? Sti yeah, but you have to start quite a long way in advance. And because it was COVID, I couldn't get to the doctor to discuss that program. Yep, yep. And also, you know, you had to take some quite strong medication to do that that had some side effects. And my husband had said that he kind of wasn't sure that he wanted me to put anything else in my body after the sheer amount of IVF I'd gone through. Um, yep. And actually, I was fine with bottle feeding the first time after six months anyway. But then Jess offered to um, share her breast milk with us and would give her breast milk to us pump. And uh, her husband, Todd, would drive by and drop off cooler bags of breast milk on our doorstep, <laughs> uh, which was incredibly generous of all of them. Um, actually, Effie ended up having, my daughter, she ended up having like reflux quite early on. And actually, the breast milk was is quite a lot thinner than formula. And actually, after about three weeks or four weeks, I started um, giving Effie formula as well. And I said, look, Jess, I don't want you to be going through this pump. She was pumping in the night, um, like a very generous spirited person, um, if you know it's not really working for us. So then, yeah, we stopped. But yeah, she, she gave breast milk. Yeah, yeah, great. Adipti, what about you? Was that something that was discussed in Greece? Um, to be honest, I didn't raise it and right. discuss it. Yeah. I always just had in mind that we would use formula. Right, mm. right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. For you, what were the, uh, the things about that you might recommend other people about Greece? Any, any tips you'd give people? Um, I would say visit, visit. Um, arrange a Skype call first. Have a conversation. Get all your questions out in the open. And just visit visit the clinic. You'll also get to see, you know, if, if you chose embryo clinic or visit other clinics in Greece. Also, you'll get to see where the baby will be born. You'll understand fully the process. I mean, like you know, you've heard from Dipen that our journey has been long, and a lot of that was down to kind of fear and kind of almost like a voyeur. I'd come to these events, but I just wouldn't take that step. And now I'm at the other side where I have. And I would honestly say, you know, as you've said, loads of people have trodden this path, and I felt that in Greece as well. So if you are feeling worried, just arrange a call. Just get your questions answered and see how you feel then. Because, to be honest, I wish I'd have done it earlier. Mm. Go, go on to surrogacy earlier, you mean? Yeah, I wish I'd have yeah. gone and to I the clinic. I hear so many people say that to me. Yeah, I, I really wish I had. And I still think it now, not in a regretful way, but I just think that I wish I'd have done this earlier. <laughs> no. How old were you then when you became a mum? 45 I am. 45. So you see and what would you say to other women who are the same age about being a mum at 45? Is it, is it much harder than you thought? What the... No, no. Like, I keep myself fit, but not extremely fit. I'm not a gym at, at the gym every day kind of person. I don't. I think you have that maturity and that appreciation and that, com that just that natural confidence that comes, you know, with, you know, once you're in your 30s or your 40s. So, like, it's just easy. It's, it's fine. It's fine. You, you know, you have your normal hassles that every parent does, but I wouldn't say it's more of a struggle. I, I'd say it's an advantage, to be honest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's good feedback. Anyone any questions they want to ask these guys um, about? Um, no. Um, uh, okay. Look, we. I think we're not going to have a, our Georgia lady come in. She just hasn't appeared in, online. Um, I'm just trying to think. Um, it, would you stay in touch with your surrogate? Is it, do you think, you know, moving forward? Do you think? Yes, be... absolutely. I mean, I'm not chatting to her all the time, but, you know, if I get a really cute picture of Effie, every so often I'll send it to her, you know, holidays, Christmas, birthdays and whatnot. We drop each other a note, uh, check in on the, each other. They've recently moved house um, and, you know, we'll share pictures of our kids and stuff at Halloween and Christmas and whatnot. So, yeah. Um, and we'll definitely go, we will go visit them. I'd love to take Effie to visit them, yeah. um, you know, when she's a little bit older and she understands. Um, so, yeah, I think we've got friends forever there, definitely. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the issue of, of your surrogate being in one state and the IVF clinic being in another, that's a cost factor you've got to factor in, isn't it, for the fly to the, yes, for the yeah, appointments? Yeah. But flights, down, uh, flights from Portland down to San Diego weren't particularly expensive. Right. They're not right. that far away. Okay, great, great. Um, what about your surrogate, Dippy, was she based in Thessaloniki? Yep, she was based in Thessaloniki, or maybe slightly out of Thessaloniki, but, you know, it was never a problem. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, look, it seems like we are going to be having a, um, our, our Georgian parent coming online after all. Um, so, just so you know, Emma is a mum... Uh, it was two, three weeks, two weeks ago, maybe three weeks oh, wow. ago, via surrogacy in Georgia. She's still in Georgia now. She's in Tbilisi now. Oh, wow. Um, and uh, waiting for exit documentation for her and her husband, Adrian. Um, like you, Dipti, Emma's an older mum. Um, uh, Adrian, her hu husband, has children via an earlier marriage. We get lots of couples who do come to us having had a child vulnerably marriage, but they have a new partnership and they decide they want to have kids together. And for Emma, this was really important. She wanted to have her own child, but she couldn't carry. She needed a donor um, and a surrogate. Um, so they uh, in, engaged in Georgia. Um, obviously, it's been, it's been dif it's difficult um, dealing with, with foreign, foreign cultures and so forth. Um, and they have had some I issues with getting birth certificates and so forth. Um, can I just ask you, just a quick review while we're waiting for Emma to come yeah. on. Yeah. How long did it take for you to come home after the birth? Yeah, so that w it, it would have been a very simple process had it not been in like the peak of the global pandemic. Um, we were going to, you know, Effie was born in America, so she was going to get an American passport and we were going to travel home on the American passport and then apply for our British, her British passport when we were here. However, at the time, there was Trump had put a ban on passports. So the passport office wasn't open in... Of course, yeah. Yeah, no one could get a passport at that time. And so we were waiting. We thought it was going to reopen while we were there. We were actually pretty relaxed about it for the first few weeks. And then it became apparent, like, my husband was on a six-week sabbatical. We were coming towards the end of our sabbatical that the passport office wasn't going to reopen. So we got in touch with a lawyer in London, which we didn't want to have to do, but we did have to, to help us. And actually we spoke to quite a few of them and they were like, it's going to take you another six to eight weeks to get back. This yep. is going to be really difficult. Um, but then we went to Natalie Gamble Associates, who is probably the most well-known yep, um, yep, yep. surrogacy lawyer here in the UK. And they had already got quite a few parents and babies home via the home office. And um, they were able to push the paperwork through to the appropriate people at the Home Office. And Effie got an emergency passport. I'm um, sorry. <laughs> no, you're right. It's fine. Um, OK, well, before we go okay? to you, Emma, we're just going to... I've got one more question for, our, for Dipti. For you, uh, how long did it take you to come home from Greece? Yeah, so for us to come home, it took, I think, about two and a half months. Two and a half months. It's a much longer process, isn't it? Because you don't get a, a Greek passport, No, do you? you get a UK passport, and yep. the UK office were impacted by COVID, short-staffed, oh. so... OK. <laughs> let's, let's say hi to Emma. Emma, thanks for joining us. This is perfect timing, in a way, because we've just been hearing about other countries. Um, so, Emma, I know you and Adrian are over in Tbilisi now. When was Baba born? How long ago was it? He was born on the 16th of February, so a month ago. Okay, okay. Um, can you tell us um, why you required surrogacy in the first place? What were the medical reasons you needed the surrogate? Well, actually, we had been trying for a child for um, nearly 10 years, and um, they never actually... We, we went through, you know, obviously tried natural. We went through lots of naturopaths and doctors, and we ended up doing IVF. We did three rounds of IVF. Um, and I did fall pregnant on the, the last round, but... It, the baby didn't um, stay. Uh, and so at the end of that third round of IVF, I was just like, I cannot do IVF anymore. You know, my body is very sensitive and um, it just didn't agree with me, all the, all the hormones and everything. And so they never actually were able to pinpoint why I couldn't fall pregnant and, you know, stay pregnant. Um, they never gave me any kind of diagnosis. 
Uh, they just, it's just what it, just, it was what it was. Yeah, yeah. Was, was it hard for you coming to terms with having to use donor eggs? Was that a sort of difficult, just for you sort of emotionally to have to say, I'm going to have to get a donor? Actually, it wasn't. Um, I, you know, I, I, by the time we discovered surrogacy and realised that there was another avenue to have a family, I was 44 or 45 years old or something. And so, you know, I'd kind of gone, there's no more options for me. Yep. Yep. And I and I grew up in a family where um, my eldest brother and sister, there's four of us, were adopted. So um, for me, the idea of um, an egg donor didn't didn't bother me at all, you know. And also, I'm quite um, a spiritual person as well. So I just believe that the little soul that was meant to come to me was meant to come to me. Yeah. And uh, regard, regardless of the the genetics. Yeah. Yeah. I know you've worked with, with Repara in, in Georgia and uh, for the process. Mm. How, how have they been to deal with this as a, as a provider? Absolutely wonderful. Like, I, I, honestly, I couldn't criticise them. Um, I did lower my expectations just for no other reason other than not understanding anything about the culture over here or the way yeah. they operate. Um, I just kind of went, okay, well, I'm not going to make any assumptions about the efficiencies or time frames or anything like that. I'm just going to keep a really open mind about it all. Um, and I found them to be really communicative. You know, we were all in a WhatsApp group together, very kind, very understanding. Um, and, yeah, I honestly, I've had a, a brilliant experience. Right. Can you explain to people, I mean, what sort of contact, if any, do you get to have with your surrogate during the process? Are you put in touch with her on WhatsApp? Or? Yeah, so we were able to decide how much contact we wanted to have with our surrogate. Yep. It was up to us. Um, everything was done through Repro Art, though. Like, I didn't have direct contact to our mm. surrogate. So any time we would want to have a catch-up with her, we would just message Repro Art. And they would organise it, like all again on um, WhatsApp or FaceTime or I remember it was FaceTime or WhatsApp yep. um, video. And uh, yes, so we were able to, you know, we have to schedule it in and plan it ahead, but we could speak to her as much as we want. But we found that we didn't want to, we, we spoke to her, I think we had four catch ups with her over the nine months. Mm -hmm. And we were conscious of, um, being respectful of her and her time as well and, you know, not being <laughs> overwhelming parents to be. Um, so we didn't want to bombard her, bombard her either. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, what w was it like, you know, being so far away from the pregnancy? I mean, was it hard given the... You were... And all three of you on the panel here were so far away when it was all happening. Was that nerve-wracking, not being around? <clears throat> um, was it nerve-wracking? No, you... I didn't find it nerve wracking. Yeah. I don't know why. I, I didn't. I just, I think, you know, when you get to a point that you, you're considering surrogacy, you've been through a lot. <laughs> you've been through, you know, so I think that, um, I think I was just so unbelievably happy and grateful that a baby was on its way that it didn't feel hard for me, no. Yeah, yeah. What about you, Dipti? Were you sort of worried because you weren't in the same country as well? Was that hard? No, no. again, I felt the same. I wasn't so worried. I had, I would receive scans every two weeks. Yeah, yeah. Um, as the baby became bigger, there'd be videos of the scans, which were quite cute. Um, so, no, I was yeah, yeah. fine. I always knew when the surrogate had an yeah. appointment and we were always in contact. Yeah. And for you, is your, I know some intended parents try and micromanage their surrogate and say, oh. you know, oh, you've got to do X, Y, and Z. Were you like that? Or were you ever happy to let go? Oh, yeah, no, no, no. I wasn't like that at all. I just, um, I just really trusted my surrogate and really trusted the agency that was managing her and, you know, trusted the hospital. So, actually, I was very relaxed during that time. As you guys say, like, it's so difficult to get to that place and all the fertility treatment that actually once you're finally pregnant and you've got past that... 12-week scan, then that was a very relaxing time for me after that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, coming back to you, Emma, did, when you made your embryos, did the first embryo transfer take or was it a number of transfers you needed? First one. We are very lucky. Yeah, wow. Okay, that's great. And when you, when you look at the egg donors in Georgia, do you get to see photos of the donors? Yes. Right. We did. Was yes. that, was that so, hard? And, 
That, I mean, that's the thing that we probably took the most time in deciding. Um, and we actually, we were um, presented with a round of potential egg donors. And we, the first round we were like, nothing works for us here. And so then they, they then presented more. Um, and we, <laughs> we, were, we were shown photos, we were shown medical history, we were shown um, you know, all sorts of anecdotal kind of notes about their lives. Uh, and it was so hard to make a decision. What it came down to for us is, <laughs> honestly, we just looked at some, someone that kind of looked a little bit like me, but also um, that they they had kind eyes. <laughs> that was the big thing for us. Yeah. <laughs> that yeah. they had kind eyes. <laughs> yeah. You mentioned before about Georgian culture. What is the culture like in Georgia? Now you've been there for some weeks, you're getting to know it a bit. What Tell us about it. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because we, you know, as having a newborn, you are a little bit in your own bubble, um, and plus it's been snowing a lot, oh, so we haven't right. been able, <laughs> we haven't been able to get out and about that much, and so really the only contact we've had are, are with Repro Art. Um, we've got a, a, an incredible nanny here that helps us a few hours a day, um, and uh, the lawyer here, and so we haven't actually had too much interaction. So. I couldn't really tell you um, too much. Yeah, yeah. I, I have got a number of intending parents who, given what's happened in Ukraine, are saying, well, Georgia's close to Russia. Is, is Russia going to invade Georgia next? Are you getting any sense over there right now of, of some fear about R Russia looking at Georgia? Yes, definitely. So um, the, the people here are very, very pro um, in support of the Ukraine. Uh -huh. And... In fact, they um, they remember what it was like when Russia invaded um, Georgia. Gosh, was it 25 years ago or 30 yeah. years ago now? Yeah. Um, and so a lot of them still have that memory very clear in their minds of what that was like. I think it ended up being war for seven days. And in fact, the nanny here, Natia, who comes and helps us, her family had to flee, um, and they for a week they walked through winter in the night, dead of night, and you know in the freezing cold conditions to escape. Um, and so. They are very fearful. The people, like the people that we are in contact with, are very fearful. In fact, our lawyer here, um, you know, she's a very accomplished woman. She's incredible, and um, she was in tears when she was e explaining to me the fear around um, Russia invading Georgia. So, but nobody knows, right? Nobody actually knows. So, um, we the, the the people here are very fearful, um, but we don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, that's really interesting to hear about. I mean, I know there's been a lot of Ukraine refugees who have come to Georgia um, in the last few weeks. We have heard that. Um, but, yeah, there are lots of intending parents who can't use Ukraine anymore who are looking at Georgia, but have uh, some of them are hesitating for the right reason. Um, look, can I understand, when you guys come over there, were you able to be there in the room for the birth? Is that allowed in Georgia? Yes. So right. we didn't know, actually... I mean, that's the one thing I would say that, you know, um, if we, we do end up doing this again, I'm now very clued into it. Like, the actual um, process of the birth and our involvement and we were not so clear on, but maybe I just didn't know the right questions to ask. But we were told, like, when we first arrived, you know, we asked, could we be the birth? And they said, yes, you can. So I was actually in the delivery room and I actually got... Um, I spent a couple of hours with our surrogate before she gave birth, um, which was really special. So we sat together <laughs> in the hospital and we just talked. I mean, she, her English isn't great, so we communicated a lot by photos. So I was showing her photos of my life and she was showing me photos of her life. Mm. And, um, and then, you know, I got to be in the delivery room and so straight away I was able to hold our son. Um, and the thing that was really special was that they made me feel like I had given birth, so um, I actually then stayed in the hospital for two nights with Sebastian and was basically, you're on, you're you a mum, you're now looking after your child. And so um, it was a, a bit of a shock to me because I, you know, obviously don't know what you're doing, but also no one, hardly anyone in the hospital spoke English. <laughs> so I'd walk out, I'd walk out to the nurse's station holding my son, like, is it time yet? Am I supposed to feed him yet? Like, and anyway, I managed to make it all work, but it was very, very special time, time for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. 
I mean, did you go straight to formula? Was there any colostrum or breast milk from a surrogate, or was that all not done in Georgia? No, same It's not done in Georgia. Yeah, it's not done in Georgia, which that, that was something that did worry me, um, and it still does, to be honest. Uh, you know, everyone says breast is best, and so the, you, know, you feel a little bit, you feel guilty about not being able to do that for your child, but mm. there was no choice here. Yeah, 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 okay. Um, I mean, is it, is it hard being in a foreign country with a newborn, or is it great bonding time for you and Sebastian and, and Adrian? What's... Uh, actually, you know what, we have a great apartment here, and we've got a great little support network, and you know what, a Adrian and I were just talking the other day saying, it's actually, it's actually a beautiful experience for us, because it's just us bonding as a family, you know, we don't of course, we want to see our family and friends and everything, but we know when we get back to Australia, we're going to get bombarded. Yeah. <laughs> everyone wants to meet Sebastian, you know, everyone wants to... And so it's nice. It is actually really nice having this time together, just the three of us. Yeah, yeah. Dipti, what it was like for you guys? You were two and a half, three months in Greece as well. Was that hard or, or do you quite like that time with... Again, um, you know, similar to you, of course, we missed our family, but it was quite special that we got to just bond the three of us um, it's it's a touristy area so we found quite a nice apartment um, it's very similar to here so they've got the equivalent of delivery and uber so we were we were quite well supported also the clinic we made quite good friends with our midwife yeah. um, so she would come once a week to check on the baby yeah I mean all three of you having had sort of births during COVID I mean, were your surrogates vaccinated? Is he for you? Was she... Oh, there was no vaccines back in there June wasn't. 2020, no. No, no. And for you guys, Dipti? Um, she wasn't vaccinated as far as no, I know. No. And I think the same for you, Emma, was it? Your surrogate wasn't vaccinated, was she? No, but they mandated she got vaccinated during the pregnancy. OK, right, right. Um, uh, got it, right. I mean, is there much COVID over in Georgia that you've heard about? Oh, look, it's dropping. I don't know too much about it. I know that they've kind of dropped all the mandates here now, a lot of the mandates anyway. Um, mm. And, it's, you know, it's not, no one's talking about COVID. They're all talking about the war, to be honest. Yeah, yeah, OK. Izzy, were you worried about your surrogate contracting COVID during the pregnancy? Was that something that was...? Um, I don't remember being hugely... The, the cases in Oregon were really, really low at that time. Right. They were, like, crazy low. I yeah. mean, you know, I was in London, which was... <laughs> it was not low. So, yeah, no, I wasn't really worried about that. Yeah, 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 OK. And Greece, was it, was it for you a worry? Um, again, the numbers were less. Greek closed their borders fairly, fairly quickly, quicker than the UK, so... Yeah. No. Yeah, yeah. Does anyone have any questions they want to ask um, these, these parents now while they've got them? Um, OK, good. Um, well, I mean, Emma, what tips would you give for other people who are considering surrogacy in Georgia? Any? Uh, I, I think do it. I mean, it's, I mean, apart from, you know, just getting a feel for what's going on um, with the war and everything, I, I just think it, um, the, the people here, everyone is so nice um, and so mm. caring and... You know, we've got this beautiful, gorgeous boy. And so, if, you know, if your dream is to have a family, then I would say go for it. Yeah, yeah, OK. I mean, what was, what was the hardest thing about the process for you guys? Um, I suppose during the pregnancy or beforehand, what, 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 was, what was really hard? The one thing that I found difficult was the vaccination um, because during the pregnancy, but just because... You know, there's not been any scientific tests done on pregnant women, really, like long-term effects. So I was very nervous about that. That was my the thing that worried me. But, you know, other people won't have that experience because, you know, we're moving out of time. Maybe the mothers will be vaccinated pre-going into this this experience. So that, that was the thing that I found very difficult, knowing whether it was going to affect... Um, the development of our child. Yeah, yeah. All right, look, thank you so much, guys, for sharing. It's been really useful to, to hear from you guys. I know there's lots of people who are really keen to watch the recordings of this session because they often don't get the chance to hear from parents, especially parents who are, who are new and have done this yeah. you know, in, the la in the last year or so. Um, so it's great. Th th thanks a heap. It's great. Pleasure. Thanks, Emma. Thank I will see you in a few days in Georgia. That's great.